the horror film genre is changing. The last five years have seen the release of the most frightening, complex, and unique visions from the genre in decades. Sure, the 90s and 2000s saw the release of some great horror films, but it never felt as consistent as it does now. It never felt like a movement, but it does now, at least for me. It is often the case that artistic movements are only truly recognized and defined in retrospect. For the people who live through them, a movement may simply feel organic, new, or even not so special at the time. Often it is only in retrospect that those people can say, that was film noir, or that was French new wave, etc. I believe that might be where we are with the horror film genre right now. There is a movement, but it hasn't yet been fully defined. Attempts have been made to define it, but I'll get to that later. There are more than a handful of horror directors impacting the genre as I speak, but in my mind, three are leading this movement. Ari Aster, Robert Eggers, and of course Jordan Peele. By the way, I listed those alphabetically by surname, not by ranking. I'm not trying to figure out who is better in this video. Rock had the sacred triangle of Bowie, Iggy, and Reed, and in my mind, the holy trinity of this new horror movement is Aster, Eggers, and Peele. In the last five years, each of these directors have made their first two films, and all six of these films have explored the horror genre in a new and exciting way. Each filmmaker has their own voice, and each film is a unique experience, but there are a few overarching similarities between them. In this video, I will examine these similarities to hopefully better understand and define this new horror movement. It's Hands Across America, a 4,000 mile long chain of Good Samaritan standing hand in hand. The trinity of directors are all admitted students of film history with master's degrees in the horror genre. I don't mean literally, of course, but they are all true fans of the horror genre. Jordan Peele in particular has outed himself as a film nerd with a borderline unhealthy obsession with the horror genre specifically, but Astor and Eggers have also acknowledged their love for past horror films. That being said, each director is not content to simply replicate or recreate the films they love, they want to remake the genre of horror itself. They don't, however, want to tear down the horror genre and rebuild it from the ground up, or subvert it simply because it's in the past. Rather, the Trinity are carving out new paths within the existing genre. Each director's knowledge of past horror films allows them a mental map of the horror genre, with which they can seek out new, uncharted territory. Ignorance of the past often means you are doomed to repeat it, and this applies to art as well. You need to be aware of what has been done to know that you're doing something new. The three directors have cited past films as inspiration for their work. For example, Peel was inspired by The Stepford Wives for Get Out, Astor was inspired by the folk horror subgenre for Midsommar, Eggers hasn't cited any direct influences, but he listed the 1922 silent film Haxon among his favorite films, which I can only assume means it was a partial inspiration for The Witch. Eggers also plans to remake the silent horror classic Nosferatu. Each of these directors are inspired by past horror films, but none of their films really resemble the films they are inspired by. The three directors subtly pay homage to the films that inspired them and work within an established genre framework to some extent, yet they are also able to create something unique. I saw a way of kind of marrying the breakup movie to the structure of a folk horror film. A filmmaker doesn't need to reject the past in order to create something new. The Trinity director's respect for the past is obvious, and this makes their unique contributions to the genre all the more engaging. It is because of, not in spite of, their reverence for past horror films that they became the horror genre's new innovators. Jesus Christ, Danny. In the past, horror was simple. The timing, the jump scares, the plot devices, the tropes were generally pretty basic. Not always, but generally. This is because at the time, it worked. Standard horror story templates, like the knife-wielding psychopath who lurks in the shadows, hadn't been completely done to death yet and still elicited some shock from an audience. This was, of course, before the internet, before every horror film ever was available at everyone's fingertips, as well as the critiques of those horror films, and the breakdowns, and the easter egg videos, etc. In the 80s and early 90s, film nerds would rent every horror flick in the video shop and discuss them with their friends, but these were outliers. They didn't represent the mainstream audience that truly determined a horror film's success. Today, however, the average moviegoer is educated on the horror genre, not only on the filmography, but also the critique of it. 
Today's mainstream audience is far too familiar with the horror genre, too educated and too perceptive to respond to simple tricks and tropes that might have worked in the past. For a horror film to really get under the skin of today's audience, it needs to be conceived and thought through with a ridiculously thorough attention to detail. Nothing escapes today's audience. They will notice everything, as I'm sure the trinity of directors are aware. Their answer to this level of scrutiny was to create films that can't be deconstructed so easily, films that can be analyzed and theorized over by the online community for years afterward. The Trinity director's attention to detail is revealed in several areas of the filmmaking process, the first of which is in the research. All three directors research their films exhaustively, but I have to acknowledge Eggers especially in this area, as the depth of his research for The Witch is especially impressive. And I read 17th century stuff like for my own enjoyment, <laughs> but, um, but certainly writing in it was difficult. Another area that showcases this detail is in the world building and backstory. For example, it's clear Astor wrote an extensive history for the family in Hereditary and their relationship with the occult, even though he knew most of these details would not make it into the script or film. The little hints we do get of this thorough backstory make us uneasy, because we instinctively sense that there is more detail behind what we are shown. A third area Area in which the details flourish is the use of dialogue. In Get Out, Dean's little jabs toward Chris are so subtle yet potent. Uh, that's the basement. We had to seal it up. Some black mold down there. Another writer might have worried the audience would miss this level of detail and written the dialogue in a more obvious way. Peel and the other two directors, however, are confident in the intelligence of the audience. They are unafraid to include a high level of subtlety and detail because they know the audience is smart enough to get it and to respond. How long have we been on this rock? Five weeks? Two days? Help me to recollect. In the 80s, Jason jumping out from behind a bush, then stabbing a sex-crazed teenager was enough to frighten an audience and entice them into returning for the sequel. I'm not that scared of Jason. You know, I, I'm, I'm scared of like the spindly dudes. Today, however, truly scaring an audience means manipulating the viewer's cognitive mind rather than simply their instinctual reactions, forcing them to question what is real and what isn't, or gaslighting as it's known. I don't mean to imply that psychological horror didn't exist in the past. In my opinion, some of the best examples of psychological horror cinema premiered in the 70s with films like The Exorcist, Rosemary's Baby, and Don't Look Now. Psychological horror as a general movement reached a peak in the 1970s to early 80s that it never completely achieved again, until recently. Astor, Eggers, and Peel all use jump scares in their films. Once again, you don't need to reject past tropes to create something new. In their films, however, jump scares are are simply one storytelling technique among many. The real engines of fear in the story are psychological. The Trinity directors will plant seeds in their stories that grow in the viewer's mind into unsettling possibilities by the film's end. And often these possibilities are left unresolved or unanswered. Too often in modern horror films, the conclusion reveals everything, or almost everything. If the conclusion does leave us with a question, it's usually something simple like, perhaps the monster is still alive. Ooh. The Trinity's films, however, will answer question after question, but in doing so pose more questions, and often deeper and more unsettling questions. By the conclusion of their films, there are usually more questions and more mysteries than there were in the first two acts, revealing all of that backstory and world building work is a temptation for a filmmaker, but it is far less scary than maintaining a mystery, especially a new, more complex mystery than the one you started with. This is a consistent characteristic in the films of all three directors. These three points are the most defined common characteristics I can come up with for the films of Astor, Eggers, and Peel. However, it's not as if 2015 was the first time these characteristics were employed in the horror genre. Despite the examples I used to distinguish this new movement from the horror genre of the past, horror, as well as art in general, is almost always an incremental evolution. The characteristics I cited were employed in films that came out in the early 2000s, 90s, 80s, and 70s, but not to the extent or as consistently as the Trinity directors are employing them. To quote Peel's former comedy partner, Key, these three directors are taking this kind of horror to a whole number level. <laughs> 
I also don't believe these characteristics have been employed by as many directors as they are now. I listed three horror directors that I believe are leading the movement, but there are others who are contributing to it and may even take up the reins of the movement in the future. For example, Jeremy Solnier, Ray Edward Schultz, Panos Cosmatos, Luca Guardagino, Mike Flanagan, David Robert Mitchell, and Jennifer Kent, among others. If this is a movement, the question now becomes, what do we call it? A 2017 article by Steve Rose in The Guardian coined the term post-horror, but in fact I hate that name. Post, as in postmodern, implies in this case that the filmmakers are destroying or rejecting the established genre tropes of the past. As I explained earlier, I don't think they are. Another term for this movement that I've noticed floating around the interwebs is elevated horror, which I also don't care for, although I don't hate it as much as post-horror. Elevated horror implies this new horror is superior to past horror. I don't believe it is this either. The horror genre is simply at a new stage of evolution. If you do agree that this is a new horror movement, I will put the titling of it on you. Years from now, when critics look back on the horror films of this era, and specifically those of Astor, Eggers, and Peel, how do you think they should refer to them? Should we call it elevated horror, or simply horror? That's no fun. Please let me know your title for this new horror movement in the comments below. Also, do you agree with the points I made in this video, or am I completely full of crap? Let me know in the comments below. If you enjoyed this video, please give it a like and subscribe to the channel if you haven't already. Check out these other horrific videos. Thanks for watching, and until next time.